Good morning. It's good to be able to say that from, you know, this place instead of my couch. Um, I'm excited about today because, well, I love Easter. I love Resurrection Day. You know, I, I love the whole Passion Week thing, how Christ walked out this eternal picture for us. Because we're human. I don't know if you've noticed being human or not. But, um, you know, I would love us to be able to sit here for an hour and think of nothing but Christ. Think of nothing but what God has done, what he continues to do, what it, what it took to save us, what it took to bring us, what it took to awaken us. Because I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but you know, the Father made the plan. The eternity passed. He made the plan to save you and me. And he made sure it was all written out for us through, through the history, the Old Testament. You know, you read through all of that stuff. And he not only pointed out what we needed to know, but he pointed out who we were. A bunch of um, interesting people. You know, I call them modern man. We were always modern man, you know. And then, at a, at a time in space, he, at the fullness of time, it says in Galatians, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem, to save, to, to bring about this vast change. And so he not only wrote it out for us, he acted it out for us. He gave us all the, <clears throat> the demonstration. He gave us all the, the visual, physical proof, if you will. But then as you notice, that still wasn't enough. That still wasn't enough. He, he had to send his Holy Spirit to stir us, to awaken us, to enlighten us as to what he was doing that whole time. And so, yeah, I would love you guys to sit here this morning and push everything out of your mind. Except God. Except the Father. Except the Son. Except the Holy Spirit. I mean, can you think about that? Can you stop thinking about America for a couple of minutes? I mean, is, is that even possible? Can you do that? How about politics or who the president is or what the last dumb decision whoever made was, you know? Can you, can you get that out of there for just a couple of minutes? Let, let's stop thinking about war. Let's stop thinking about pain and suffering. Even your own personal sickness and condition. Can, can you get that out of your mind for a minute? Can you imagine not thinking about some very seemingly important issues? Just for a little space of time. Actually stop thinking about you for a minute. How, how do you pull that off, right? I mean, do you possess such control over your mind that for an hour... You can push yourself aside. You can push the world aside. You can push everything else aside. And focus on Jesus Christ. But as soon as we begin to think that way, very rapidly, things start bombarding your mind. You Anything like me, you know? Our, our minds... Have, we are a very modern man. And modern man has one problem. Modern man. It's so, it's so true. It's so glaringly obvious. And like, we hate to, to think about that. You know, right from the day of creation, day six, Adam and Eve show up. And there they are in the garden and they have everything necessary, everything imaginable before them, surrounded by everything they could desire. God even comes down and walks with Adam in the cool of the day. I mean, just what a crazy idea. And yet one day, one day soon, I think, 
they kind of got caught up in self. I don't know if you noticed it or not. But they got in a dinner discussion. What should we have for dinner? And suddenly, life became about them to the point that they ignored God and followed another wisdom, you know, followed another, you know, idea. And, you know, off goes mankind. And from that moment, I, I, I find it so interesting, modern man always decides to think about himself first. We always start in the weirdest position, me. And then everything else must correspond to me or it, it isn't really important. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't work for me, you know, all of that stuff. Hmm. You think about Abraham. Abraham was called, hey, Abe, I want you to leave everything. I want you to go this way. And, and he thinks about that for a while and then he, he takes his dad, takes his nephew, takes everything he owns and off they head in that direction until they get to a place of delay and they wait there until dad dies and you know then he begins to follow he begins to obey because you know self got in the way they think about Moses here's Moses so the burning bush and he's walking around the desert and here's this bush that is on fire but it's not being consumed Here's the all-consuming fire of God, but it's not consuming. And he decides to stop there for a minute and take a look, because this is weird, right? And the bush speaks to him. The, the one in the bush speaks to him. Says, hey, take your sandals off your feet. The place where you're standing is holy ground. And, and after that moment, Moses refuses to look, to look at the bush, because, well, God is speaking to him out of the bush. And he begins to tell him, I want you to, uh, I'm going to send you back to your nation. Set these people free. And immediately, Moses turns to self. Did you notice that? I, I, I can't go there. I, I don't speak good, Lord. I got a stammering problem and a stuttering problem, and I got all kinds of issues. I'm probably not your best bet. Let's sit down and talk about who maybe you should send. You know, I got a brother that's pretty good, and you know, he, isn't it interesting how modern man's problem is modern man? You think about during the Exodus. You know, God has come into the land and he's done all of these signs, all of these wonders, all of these miracles. And he leads them out of that place and he begins to supply them with everything they could ever need. Not want, need, right? He, he's revealed his power. He's, he's divided the Red Sea and walked them through on dry ground. And he's used that very activity to destroy their enemy that was pursuing them. He's supplied them with a pillar of cloud in the day. If you've ever been in the Middle East, in the desert, this pillar of cloud would be great relief. Great relief, you know. Can you imagine out there without your SPF you know, 30 or 50 or 100 on for a couple of days. And here they've got this pillar of cloud and it not only provides shade for the, for the couple of million people, but it directs them, leads them, guides them. And then at night, you ever been in a desert at night? You live in Idaho, you, you have, you know, and it gets cold at night. And now they have a pillar of fire that provides light and warmth and direction and guidance. <sighs> he supplied them with manna. He supplied them with water. He has supplied them with leadership and guidance. And yet, what do we hear him say? Oh man, if we were just back in Egypt, you know, like we used to be with the leeks and the garlic. and the onion. Apparently they like their spicy food, I don't know. But, it, you know, it's, it's interesting because man has this ability 
to disregard everything God is doing, everything God does around him, everything God is active in, and only think about self. Only think about self. And we see the lengths that God goes to to try to get man's attention. The whole Old Testament, trying to get your attention. Oh, maybe I'll break through to their intellect, and so I'll, I'll show them these pictures. I'll give them these illustrations. I'll show them what's really going on. Not too effective. And so then he steps into plan B. Well, it's not really plan B. It's, it's part B of the whole plan. And he sends, you know, at the fullness of time, he sends forth his son into this world. <laughs> he sent him forth to engage another part of man, not just your intellect, not just your thinking. Now you can see. Now you'll see it walked out. Now I'll take these pictures in the Old Testament and make them real, and you'll you'll see what the Lamb of God is. You'll see what a sacrifice is. You'll see how God so loves you. You'll see all of this stuff. It'll become physical. It'll become real. It'll become personal. <laughs> so Christ comes and he's born according to the ancient prophecies. He's born to a virgin in Israel, in a place called Bethlehem of Judea. He's shortly after that driven into Egypt to get away from Herod, this king that wants to kill him because he can't have another king around. Then they come back from Egypt and, and they move up north to a place called Nazareth and he becomes a carpenter's son and just lives seemingly a normal life for like 30 years. All of that foretold in the Old Testament. And then one day, he shows up in Judea again, outside of Jerusalem, down by the river. And he has John the Baptist baptize him. Here's this baptizer that's come on the scene and he's... he's He's moving a whole nation. They're all stirred up. They know something's going on, but they don't know what. And he goes back to Nazareth, and he, as was his habit, he went in the synagogue, and they handed him the scroll of Isaiah, and he opens the scroll of Isaiah, and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Isn't it interesting? All of those years, wasn't happening. But now... Now the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me, he has, how would you say this? He has made me his Messiah, the anointed one, the called one, the chosen one. He has made me his Christ. And my job is to preach the gospel, right? To publicize it. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, to the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the time when the Lord said the doors are wide open, come. And he goes about preaching, teaching things that nobody's ever heard of before. You know how he did it. Oh, you heard it said in the past, thou shalt not do whatever. But I tell you, he taught as somebody who had the absolute authority to take the word of God and say, this is what it means. This is what it looks like. Nobody ever taught like that. You know, he, he had this ability to go about and touch people and heal them. The blind and the lame, and the lepers. He had this way of going about that nobody ever had a way of going about like that. And he's trying to draw the eye. He's trying to draw the physical. He's trying to show blind people, 
people that are ignoring God, people that think they already know God and, and go certain ways, you know. He's trying to shake that up. He even calls some disciples to himself, you know. And he empowers them to go out and exercise the same authority. To heal and to witness. And they seemed very good, very decent men. But even they are modern men. Have you read the story? You know, Jesus has set his face to go to Jerusalem. He's told them, hey, when I get there, they're going to arrest me. They're going to beat me and torture me. They're going to turn me over to the Gentiles. They're going to crucify me. And on the third day, I'll rise again. And they miss that third day rise again thing. They're, lo they're looking at him like, you know, dumb Americans that can only think of themselves. And, and they say, yeah, but when you get there and when you set up your kingdom, can I sit on your right hand and can I sit on your left hand? Do you see how modern man always brings it back to himself? Always brings everything God is doing. Yeah, but how does that affect me today? I find it so fascinating that we are that way. That's why God's plan has to play out to all of mankind. It can't just be to your brain. It can't just be to your... Uh, it, it's, it, they've hidden that information in a book and I don't read so I don't get it. Well, all about you again, right? Well, I don't know if Jesus really was because I wasn't there and I didn't see it and, I, and it's suddenly it's all about you again. And so all of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has to be involved just to break through you. Just to break through you. That fascinates me. It's, it's so clearly right before us, and yet it's not so clearly right before us. So God plays out this holy week. He lays it out before us. So I want you to play pay particular attention to this. I want you to be able to see it. See it in your mind's eye. I want you to be able to understand that a real guy, Jesus of Nazareth, came and did this and walked through that. But he wasn't just Jesus of Nazareth. He was Jesus, the Son of God. Because man's hardness and man's blindness and man's fall has so corrupted man that man can think of nothing, man can see nothing, and man can feel nothing beyond himself. So Passion Week, you know, last week, Palm Sunday, the, the day that Jesus would on purpose send his guys to go get a donkey, a foal of a donkey, and bring to him and ride down that descent into the Mount of, from the Mount of Olives into the Temple Mount area on this donkey, fulfilling a very specific Old Testament prophecy. And he, he's very careful about the way he does it because this is March 30th, 33 A.D., Palm Sunday, a day predicted, a day foretold by God to Daniel, this very day your Messiah will show up. And some people seemingly caught it, you know? He begins to do this and the people get all excited and they start crying out, Hosanna! You know, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and they get themselves worked up in a frenzy. You know, you, you can see that happening sometimes during a good worship song or during a powerful sermon. He rides down, enters into Jerusalem and goes into his father's house and cleans house. Again, trying to get people's attention. This isn't your house. This isn't where you do what you want to do. This is where God says you can come and receive prayer. You can come and worship. You can come and meet with God in a place like this. <sighs> 
But as he's approaching Jerusalem, we see Jesus sitting on that colt, weeping. Not just weeping, convulsing. And we see the, the physical part of Jesus. We see the man part of Jesus. Because he's fully man and fully God. But the fully man part goes, I'm doing this and nobody even understands what I'm doing. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know. The one who kills the prophets, stones those who have sent to them. How often I wanted to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Oh yeah, there, were mo there was momentary praise. There was momentary worship. <sighs> But how quickly modern man goes back to himself. How quickly modern man goes back to the events of the world and the politics and the sickness and the health and the, all of the stuff that gets in our way. He knows they're really only interested if he rides into Jerusalem and sets up his kingdom and throws off Rome and lets everybody you know, live a free life in their own way. <laughs> because just four days later they're going to be standing around crying out crucify him crucify him we will not have this man rule over us what happened what happened in those four days a modern man showed up right well he, he didn't set up his kingdom like us thinking he's going to He's actually allowed these people to arrest him and, and now it looks like they're going to, you know, kill him. And if they can kill him, then he can't be the God we need. He can't be the victor I need. I need more than that. And here is Jesus Christ, the eternal, the co-equal, the co-eternal with the Father, and that part, that nature of Christ knows they're never going to understand what I am walking out without the Word of God, without the Son of God walking it out, and without the Spirit of God making it real to them. They're never going to see it or understand it. So later that week, they put him on trial. They parade him through town from this guy's house to that guy's house to Pilate's place to Herod's place to, you know, all over the place. The Sadducees will try him. The Pharisees will try him. The scribes and the chief priests will try him. All the religious rulers will get their shot. Then the Gentiles will try him. Are you a king? Are you not a king? You know, what's this have to do with us? Who are you really? You know, modern man will try him. Is he really the one we need or do we need another? Is he meeting my needs? Surely if he was God, if he was... If he was the one we were expecting, he wouldn't have allowed any of this stuff. It would have been different. So Thursday evening, after that Last Supper, he's arrested. He's falsely accused, he's mocked, he's beaten, he's scourged. And early the next morning, they nail him to a cross. His only charge... He's a king without a kingdom. He can't be a king without a kingdom. I don't know if you would understand that, but he's a king. He tells Pilate, yeah, I'm a king. But my kingdom isn't from here. Otherwise, my guys would fight. You know? They strip him. They scourge him. They nail him to that tree. 
right on the main road coming into the city from the north. They begin to mock him. And then the father turns the lights out. That had to get your attention. It's a full moon night, full moon day, so it's not just a uh, some kind of normal event. You don't get eclipses on full moons. And uh, he turns out the lights and he lays the sin of the whole world upon his only begotten son. As he's there in agony and suffering, being mocked and spit on and made fun of, that's when the father pours it on. And he does it in complete darkness because it's just between him and the son. And he pours out all of his holy wrath. Everything you have ever done to tick God off, he pours upon his son. He pours that punishment and that shame and that ugliness and that sin. And in those moments, Christ becomes that Lamb of God. He becomes that perfect sacrifice. And at the end, he takes a little sip of sour wine, just enough to clear his vocal cords, apparently. And he cries out, To tell us, die. It is finished. It's paid in full. And he gives up his ghost and he dies. And he may hang in there another hour, two hours. We don't know. We know he died about three o'clock in the afternoon. And they take him down before dark. A couple of, you know, moderate believers in Jesus. Their Messiah has just died, so they're not really sure what to do with that. But they still want to respect him and honor him. He was a great man. So they take him down, they clean him up, and they lay him in a tomb. And they go home to think about, well, what a waste of time this has been. Last three years, we've been following this guy, and turns out, probably wasn't the guy to follow. Seemingly, won't help us. And modern man becomes modern man again, and it becomes all about them. We hoped that this was the chosen one. It can't be, because look at how it is. And through all of this, God is playing out a scene. He's written it. He's put in every detail. And now it's being walked out detail by detail by detail. And yet, we find ourselves unable to read it. Can't really understand it. We we find ourselves, you know, I wasn't there when Jesus hung on the cross. I wasn't there when the Father laid the sin, all of my sins upon him and paid. I I I, can't, I find it hard to believe. And so you need more. Have you noticed you need more? Need more than your Bible? You need more than simple faith? Because even simple faith is a gift. It's not really yours. It's been given to you. The most amazing event in all <clears throat> of created history being acted out over the last week, you know, back in 33 AD, around the 1st of April, that God would create and then that God's creation, God's perfect and holy and amazing creation would be ruined, would be ravaged, would be taken captive by an enemy and by the stupidity of modern man willing to think only of himself instead of his creator, instead of his God. And man fell. 
and in that deception and through cunning man willingly set God aside and put himself in that place <laughs> and that starts this downward spiral all the way from Genesis chapter 3 to the end of the Bible is this downward spiral where things get darker and darker and worse and worse and you go from being you know just seemingly out of touch to being dead in trespasses and sins to being blind and not not enough just being blind but deaf and dumb and just there's nothing about you that can respond to God unless God interrupts your little world for a moment. And we're all in this place where we're separated from God and spinning down into the wrath of God that's awaiting. We, we know something about that death, you know, that death when Adam and Eve ate that fruit was a spiritual death. It happened immediately. There was this separation from God that happened immediately, and that separation leads to a physical death that will lead to eternal separation if it's not corrected. We're told that man is blind. And we sometimes think, well, just turn on the light. So we share Bible verses with people. We, we try to drag them into the light. Look at this. See this. <coughs> have, you ever, have you ever met a blind person? It doesn't matter if you walk them outside and the sun is glaring. They can't see it. That, that's our condition, by the way. We're, bl we're blind. We're dead. We're blind. You know? Isn't it interesting? God goes through all of this for dead people, for blind people. But he knows, one day I'm going to stroll by this guy. One day I'm going to stroll by this person and I'm going to let him see for a moment. I'm going to let him come awake for a moment. Here we see Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our Master, our King, <laughs> walking out all righteousness, completely obedient to everything that has needed to happen, that the Father desired to happen. And at his greatest moment of personal modern manhood, at that rock in the garden, or it's just him and the Father. And he says, Father, man, if there's a plan B, plan B would be really good right now. But he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Did you see what modern man just did? Modern man just moved self out of the way for a moment in time and said, God, this isn't about me. This is about your will, your plan, your way. Let's go do that. <laughs> That's what happened. That's what happened when they crucified him. That's what happened when he rode in and they didn't really accept him. They didn't know who he was. That's what happened this last week. And then for the last couple of days, his body lay in that grave. Oh, he wasn't in that grave. Don't ever get that idea. Oh, he wasn't in hell. Oh no, don't get that idea. What did he tell the thief on the cross that morning? That night? Today you will be with me in paradise. Where am I going to be? I already know where I'm going to be. Oh yeah, but this body's got to lay around for a couple of days and then it's going to get back up. You remember how the girls come to the tomb that morning and they're afraid because, man, there's been a big earthquake and there's been some spiritual activity with angels and, and things are going on. And 
they run into the angels out in front of the tomb. And the angels, I, I love angels. They, they remind me of Spock, you know. Why are you looking for the living where the dead are? That, that doesn't make any sense. That's illogical. Why would you do that? Well, because this is where we left them. And this is where people stay when they're dead. They usually stay right where we leave them. And the angel just does this amazing thing. He's not here. He is risen. That thing that was dead, that thing that you just leave here and, and you walk away from and you think, well, that's over. You know, that's, that's that. That thing that was dead is alive and it's gone now. It's out. It's moving. It's active. Do you understand what that angel just told you and me? Because Christ came to represent you and me to the Father and to pray for all of our sins. And when he says, he's not dead, he's alive. Do you realize he's pointing to you and to me? He's not dead anymore. Oh no, he can read it. He can see it. He can understand it now. It's become real to him. That life <clears throat> that was in Christ is now in every believer. That life, that power. We can sit here this morning. Isn't it crazy? We can sit here this morning knowing God wrote that Old Testament. God wrote that New Testament. I've been through it. I've seen some details and I've seen how they've worked out. You weren't there. You've seen them. They are real to you. You weren't there when they crucified your Lord. But oh, how it's real to you this morning. How real it was to see him there being pierced by those guys with the big hammers and the big tent stakes things as they, they put him through his wrists, as they put him through his feet, and as they prop that board up and all the weight comes to bear and you hear that groan and yet what do you hear? Father, forgive them. Oh, you know exactly what's going on there because that was you nailing him there. Because I had ignored him and I had rejected him and I didn't care until one day the Holy Spirit came through Mark and gave him eyes to see and ears to hear, gave him life. Have you noticed how all of God is involved in your modern man life and what he wants it's a few minutes of your time what he wants is for you to push self aside long enough to focus on him for a few minutes he's walked out all of these amazing things he's done things that are unfathomable and yet he so loves you that he knows if I don't send my spirit, never going to catch it. Though I wrote it out plainly, though I made it black and white and super clear, though I had my only begotten son become a human and walk it out physically, excruciatingly plain if they don't have their eyes open if they don't have life given to them if they don't come to the faith they will still miss it all because modern man is all about modern man it's all about me. Lord, if you can fit in there, well, cool. Let's go ahead and do that a little bit. Not too much, because I, I don't want to be one of them crazy ones. But, you know, if you could just slide in and, and save me and get me to heaven, that's great. But, you know, isn't it funny? It's still all about me. 
Isn't it funny? We can sit here. We can be saved. We can know the truth. And self is still so powerful that we can push God aside. Oh, well, on this day, on this day, would you push self aside just for a few minutes and sit there face to face with the glory of God who so loved you that he sent his only son to die in your place, to remove your sins, to wash you and cleanse you. You see, that couldn't just be any Lamb of God. That had to be the Lamb of God. Had to be the only begotten Son of the Father. Without spot, without blemish. You know what that's like. When you're born and you have a birthmark, you, it's a bummer. You know, you get this spot. Christ had no spots from his birth. For us, that spot would represent Adam's sin. Passed down through the bloodline. You know, I'm, it wasn't my fault. I was born with it. I was born with a spot. It's a huge spot. Covers all of me. And then blemishes are something you pick up in this life, right? As you're going along, you know, you break your wrist in three places and you, you get a little blemish going on. You, you, something happens and you get blemishes. And Christ had none of those. He didn't pick up anything through this life. You know what a blemish is? A blemish is when you decide to sin. When you decide to be a modern man and push God aside and it's all about me. And Christ came with none of that and offered it all for us who are totally infected with that. When that first um, leper comes to the Lord, it says he is full of leprosy. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been in a leper colony or ever looked up pictures or ever just had a whiff of the death that is in a leper camp like that. But here comes this guy and leprosy is eating him alive. No nose. No ears. No fingers. No toes. All been worn off. Because the first thing leprosy does is make you numb. And then you don't notice that you're dragging your feet on the ground. You don't notice that you're wearing your hand off while you're doing this certain job. You just don't notice. And this guy comes up and he falls before the Lord Jesus. And he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make this clean. You can totally change this. And the Lord, I picture him as he smiles at this guy who has this little bit of faith and he says oh I am willing and it says immediately that guy is cleansed immediately that guy has brand new ears immediately that guy has a brand new nose and fingers and toes and feeling immediately. In Corinthians chapter 2, it says this, but the natural man, the way we're born, the, the man after Adam does not receive the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Corinthians 2.9 But as it is written, eye has not seen, <clears throat> nor ear heard, nor has entered into the hearts of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, even the deep things of God, and makes them real to you. 
And so I'm not trying to say that Jesus hasn't done it all, because he has. But I'm here to say that the Father has done it all. And I'm here to say that the Spirit has done it all. Because that is God. And when God works, He works on all of you. He doesn't just wake up your ear. He doesn't just give you eye for a second. No, He takes you from that grave, that death, and He brings you to life. He brings you to life. So as we sit here today and just think about Jesus, just think about God for a minute. All that it took to bring you here, all that it took to get you to the place where you set yourself aside enough to see him, to acknowledge him, to believe him. Let me ask you, as you sit here, do you know these truths? Are they really in? Do you realize what an act of God that was to break into you and make that real to you? We kind of ignore that sometimes. Oh, God works in mysterious ways. And, and he does. But he worked in you. <laughs> he worked in me. Is there any reason... We should not be sitting here full of joy. Full of this knowledge that God so loved me. That at the fullness of time he sent his only begotten son. Born of a woman, born of a virgin. To come, to walk out this plan. And then he sends his spirit and gives me eyes to see it. Gives me ears to hear it. He gives me a Bible to read and understand and go, man, never saw that before. I've been reading this thing for a couple of days. I never saw that before. Where'd that come from? <clears throat> and every time that happens, he's pushing himself aside so you see a glimpse of him. And every time you take a moment and push self out of the way and say, God, come and sit with me. God, come and hang out with me. God, come and speak with me. God, help me to bring praise and worship and adoration and joy and amazing grace back to you just to say thank you. Every time that happens is a miracle, an absolute miracle. And we're so much into modern man, we kind of just, eh, that's normal. This happens to everybody. Do you realize it doesn't? Do you realize how crazy it is that you would sit here this morning in his hand? In his hand, alive. Someone who was once dead, now alive. Now in his kingdom. Not in the kingdom of darkness and kingdom of death and kingdom of deadness, you know, that place. He has transported you into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So today, because He lives, I live. His life is now my life, and my life is now His life. And I don't know how that works, but I'm excited about it. He's given me sight. He's given me belief. He's given me wonder and awe. He's given me understanding. He's the giver. He's the one who came and provided everything and then freely gives. And I am simply a receiver of his amazing gift. <laughs> and 
as we sit here this morning, we're sharing that same life. So we get an opportunity to take communion. I thought, what a good day to take communion, right? The day that Christ got out of that grave and the day he would look at his, his guys and say, I want you to partake of my life and I want you to partake of my death. I want you to partake of all of me. And that's what we're going to do. We'll hold a, a little cracker in our hand and it's his life. It's the truth. It's the facts. He came. He did. He walked it out. And then we have that little cup. And it's his death. And we get the opportunity to partake of his death because he took our death for us. You see, as we sit here today, we will never die. We have the word of God on it. You will never die. You will never be separated from God. Because you have been introduced to him. You have been brought to him. You have been given his life. That life can't just escape. So we get this honor. Of sitting in our chair with our modern man or woman. In that chair. And for a few minutes. During this next song as we get up and walk around and grab our elements and come and sit back down, in those few minutes, would you push yourself aside? And would you drag him into the forefront of your mind? Into the forefront of your emotion? Into the forefront of your very being? And take a moment and say, oh, Lord God, my Savior, my King, praise you. Praise you that I get the access and the opportunity and the joy of these moments. Lord, bring more of these moments. Father, we, uh, we praise you that you had the plan, that you knew in advance we needed the help. We didn't just need help. Lord, we needed you. And we didn't just need a piece of you, we needed all of you. And that's exactly what you provided. So Father, come and join us. Oh, Lord Jesus, come. And help us partake of you. And O oh Spirit, come and stir within us. Bring us life. Bring us love. Bring us passion and purpose. Mm -hmm. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That evening as Jesus sat with his friends, those who were closest to him, those who he most longed to be with. And yet those who were so weak and so human and so full of frailty. I mean, Peter was about to deny him. Judas was about to betray him. They were all about to run from him. Leave him alone. He sat there. I think with a smile on his face. Because he 
saw them not just as modern men. He saw them as sinners needing the ultimate sacrifice. And he was about to supply that. So can you picture yourself sitting at that table because you're his friends? Don't you love that in John when he says, I no longer call you servants. You're no longer just some worker of mine doing some task for me. But he says, I call you friends. For I want you to know everything that's going on. Everything that the Father's told me, I'm going to tell you. Everything that I do is going to be for you. Because I want no longer to live alone. I want to live with you. And he takes that bread and he passes it around the table and he says, break you off a chunk of this. This now represents in this context my body, my life, everything I'm willing to do and go through and be for you. This represents that. This is how much I love you. This is love. And I want you to take of my love and just devour it. Well, don't just think it's a cracker. Oh, see the spiritual picture. See the spiritual meaning. This is my life that I give, that I laid down for you. And then he does the craziest thing. He gives thanks for a body that's about to be brutalized and murdered. Father, I thank you, I praise you that we can sit here and share my life. I thank you for this body because I know what it's about to do. Well, I'm human and so I see the physical side of it and that doesn't impress me very much. That doesn't seem like very much fun. But I'm also fully God and I know the spiritual side of this and I know that ultimately what this is is it is restoring creation and it is putting away Satan. Thank you, Father. And then he says, take, eat. And then he picks up that cup And I'm sure as you looked at it, it's red, sparkly. And he says, guys, this now takes on a whole new meaning. This is now my blood in the new covenant, which is shed for all who will come, for any who will believe. And that drained out, shed, blood does just what it does in an offering, in a sacrifice. It cleanses. It washes. It removes. But no longer just temporary, like in the Old Testament when they would bring a lamb and, you know, that lamb, it would be active for a while, but then you'd remember your sin. You'd re-sin and you'd have to come back with a new lamb. No, this lamb, this blood, shed once forever. Once forever and for every one. And any who will come and partake of the shed life of Jesus Christ will gain true life. And in that real life, true life, everlasting life, age-abiding age life, in that life, no need for more life. Because what was dead, what was broken, what was sin, what was corrupted has now been remade through the blood of Christ. And we now sit here in a place where we never have to take of this blood again. But we get the privilege 
of taking it every time we think about it because it becomes so real to us. We are now, right now, proclaiming the death of Christ. And we get to thank God and say, Father, thank you that you filled him full of blood and that you put him on that cross and that you nailed him there and that you tortured him there for me. And then you poured out his blood on the ground in this great symbolism that for all the death that has ever taken place on planet Earth, this covers it, this trumps it. This is greater than because this poured out blood doesn't bring death. This poured out blood brings life. Oh, Father, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.